So welcome, uh, all of you. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we get to spend some time talking really with, I think, some of the most talented people um, in the academy and in film. And we get to bring this, um, the questions and um, sort of thoughts about history and film and television together. And so this is just for our viewers, this is gonna be conversational. We'll all be kind of talking in organic. Um, I get to just serve as the moderator and uh, to hang out with this rock star panel. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw out the first question and uh, ask whoever feels so moved um, to, to answer. And I'm gonna start really, we'll start with thinking about the film Self-Made and, or rather series, not a film. Um, this four part series Self-Made about Madam C.J. Walker. And I'm gonna ask how accurate uh, are the portrayals of the various characters in self-made and as a historian you know I, that's the first you know i'm the worst person to go to watch a tv show with or go to movies with because that's the first thing i'm always going to to ask and so i thought maybe we could start there and this this really isn't necessarily a question about precise historical accuracy but more about kind of representation um representation and the way that history through a character like Madam C.J. Walker, how that is, um, how we do that, how, how that's done in, in self-made. So maybe one of you or all of you can uh, jump in and weigh in on the portrayals of, of the various characters in self-made. Um, I'll start. I mean, it's, you know, of course, important that this is not a documentary. It does not purport to be one, um, but it does purport in some ways to give audiences a sense of who Madam C.J. Walker is or Madam C.J. Walker was and the people in her circle around her. And I think what I was really struck um, by was how much, um, how little we learn about Walker actually in the film, in the series. Um, I, you know, her, you know, not so much about inaccuracy, but every, you know, kind of production has to choose its emphasis. Um, but we learn very little, for example, about the fact that she is a child of the Reconstruction era and was born in Louisiana and the struggles that she had being orphaned and, and, and married at 14 and sort of contextualizing her life there so that her kind of meteoric rise, which is, you know, exceptional. She truly is one of those people of the 20th century, I think, who lived an exceptional life. Um, the greater context of that, I think, gets muted because we learn so little about that early part. And then certainly, I think um, one of the things that's been really interesting watching the reaction on social media, et cetera, is, and this is a good thing, I think, that people are running trying to figure out more. And the character, I think, that they um, are, are really curious about is the Addie Monroe character, who is loosely based on um, Annie Monroe, um, who was um, you know, Madam Walker's, you know, kind of business rival, um, who started a company that preceded Walker's, a company that Walker worked for, and they had this, you know, very kind of public um, rivalry in the Black press about their products, right? These are, these are two Black women getting started at a time where very few Black women had those kind of businesses. Um, but in terms of how she's portrayed, the life that is portrayed on the, the small screen of, of this production and Annie Moreau's life, which is very similar to Walker's in the sense that she also is a child of reconstruction. Um, she also was um, orphaned through illness and other things in her family and also had a, a difficult life that is erased from this. And so I think though, just the two main characters in some ways, uh, we, we don't learn as much about them as we, we probably could. Mm. Other thoughts? I think uh, what I was thinking is it, it really is a shame that this film didn't give a sense um, of how robust the hair care industry was during the period that they were alive. There was certainly um, Annie Malone and certainly Madam Walker, but there were other people that weren't as successful. There were men, <laughs> there were white people trying to market to black folks. Like the, the hair care industry that uh, Malone and Walker actually ended up standing atop at some at some point was jam packed uh, for a minute. You had you had white companies coming up with black characters um, mm -hmm. and saying, "Well, it must just be black people like to see black people uh, doing black hair, so let us just go get us somebody who look like Mammy and come over here and 
you know, talk to the black people. And so like the, the stories and the drama and the um, nuances and the, um, what it took for those two women to kind of stand atop that heap, um, I think would, would have been amazing to tell. I think it really would have pulled out some of the characteristics that um, they wanted to focus on about the hard work and um, vision and belief in self and trust. I mean, clearly the, sh the portrayal um, that the screenwriters were going with, what they wanted us to remember and to think about, Madam, were those kinds of characteristics. She worked hard. She didn't care what other people said. She had a vision. She trusted herself. It didn't matter what um, what others, who others, like she inspired loyalty amongst people. She, you know, had some generosity to her a little bit. Um, but, you know, there were, there were uh, characteristics that they wanted to focus on and they could have done that, uh, I think, as well as show a more robust um, view mm -hmm. of what it was like to make an industry um, at that time. Mm -hmm. And then also thinking about the people that she surrounded herself with. I mean, she was very intentional about engaging people who had um, knowledge and skills. And so in the film, you, you have the Freeman B. Ransom character and sense of some of his loyalty and his care, both he and his wife and their children, a very close relationship with Madam. But, but he was also her protector. And so when, when you see that, you know, he would not engage someone like Sweetness and bring illicit money into the business. He, he kept people like that away from Madam. Uh, he, he, was, he was upset that she was interacting with Marcus Garvey and, and, and A. Philip Randolph and, and Adam Clayton Powell Sr. So Sweetness didn't have a chance. Um, you know, and, and so, but you, you, you missed that piece. And he was, he was very concerned about that legacy. And that's, that's, that, that bond is very important. That earlier this month, I actually had lunch with Alilia Bundles and Judy Ransom Lewis, Freeman B. Ransom's granddaughter. That bond, that love still exists to this day and so uh, and then there's other people Marjorie Stewart Joyner they kind of give you a hint of Marjorie at the end um, but the people that worked in the office with her I mean she was very intentional about recruiting the best and the brightest and so that doesn't that doesn't fully come through mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I maybe to say shout out to the black women of St. Louis mm -hmm. Um, Annie Turnbull Malone is like a, a hero, a heroine for them. I mean, she is monumental in that community and the philanthropic, philanthropic work that she's done for Black St. Louis and the legacy of that work. They're really invested in protecting it. So they were some of the main ones who came out on social media like, wait a minute, this is an inaccurate portrayal. And I love seeing this kind of conversation swell outside of the Academy, right? So it's not just historians who are the ones who are saying, no, this is inaccurate and here are the costs of these inaccuracies. It's people from the community who are invested in community oriented histories and protecting those histories who are also coming to the table to participate in this conversation and correct some of the historical inaccuracies of the series. I, I you know, I think that's like the perfect segue um, for this next question that I was going to throw out. Maybe I'll ask you, Andre, to, to kind of lead with this, um, with the response to this question. But you know, first of all, I want to, I want to make a, a point of saying, um, of congratulating all the sisters who were involved in the production of Self Made, because that, that's something, I suppose, especially as National Director of the Association of Black Women Historians, I'm, I have deep respect um, for the screenwriter, directors, uh, producers, all of whom, for the most part, are Black women. Uh, and that is a sort of, it's a Herculean task to uh, have a project and follow it all the way through completion. And so I think that's important to note. But with that said, you know, I'm, I'm going to ask the question about holding writers and producers. Should we hold writers, directors, producers in film and television to the same kind of standards we place upon historians? Um, and Andre, maybe you can sort of talk a little bit about that, what are, what are these sort of specific challenges that might make this request, task, thought difficult about these standards? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll amplify your point about the idea of how difficult it is to get these things made and done. You know, to get a movie made in the world is an accomplishment. Uh, to get it approved by a studio and for it to flow is another major accomplishment. 
what happens on that path to get there um, are the stumbling blocks and the mistakes and the folks with ideas and, and, and the little notes like, oh, well, why don't you do this? Like you, when it really comes down to, you really do have one or two people in a room making suggestions of saying, oh, this will make more money. Make this angle, try this, and, and just ignore its complete history, which is problematic. Um, so I think, you know, I, 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 I've been thinking about something a friend of mine said to me a while ago. She talked, I remember in high school learning about this concept of literary license. And what does it mean when an artist takes a story and recreates it in their own way? Um, when it comes to African American stories and Black stories that we are seeing now that are coming to rise, and with the advent of Netflix throwing tons of money at these stories and situations, uh, we have a few of them coming out right now. And I think I've, there have been a few times I watch issues and shows and go, that really shouldn't have been made, you know, but it's made. Here we are. And what are you going to do with it? This film itself, um, well, I don't, I don't have all the historical facts as deep as some of you in the room do, but I did watch and go, that doesn't seem right. And that, this is not spot on. And this is problematic. But I did see the power and the strength. And I got messages from young women saying, I didn't know she invented the hot comb. Mm. And that was a real moment of transition for a lot of people. You know, so, hey, I see some head shaking right there. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about right there. Like that notion that was put, they, they, they sensationalized, they Hollywoodized this movie to death. Uh, the series, I should say, to death, to make it more sellable. You could see and you could hear and read that there are people in the room who did not understand as fully what her legacy was about. You know, I grew up hearing about Madame Shuja Walker and had my myths and notions and ideas. And I think while I do celebrate the authors and the directors and the writers and all the folks involved in putting this story on, the myth is the goal and the seek for the lowest hanging fruit when it came to the audience. Um, this is not to put down a community, but I can see this film playing very well and the beauty piles that I visit when I was sitting with my mother and my sister, and they're like, oh yeah, child, yup, 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 and that's enough, as opposed to the actual historical correctness, the historical um, significance that's really, that's, that's missing for the project itself. So I, I, when I look at the whole situation, I think decisions were made to say, you know what, let's just get this made and get it out there. And here's a, here's a real moment that for me that showed me there were problems. When I first saw those fantasy scenes, anybody who knows when it comes to writing, when it comes to a movie or a television, when you go to fantasy, that means you're stuck and you mm -hmm. don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. You're trying to pull the audience in some other way. That's my, for my working in film for the longest time, it's like, oh, well, how about a fantasy scene? Like that is an instant out, which mm -hmm. gave me worry um, pretty soon on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think there's something about storytelling, right? So as historians, um, for many of us, I think particularly those of us that do African-American history, um, it's about engaging the field, but it's also about telling these stories, recouping these stories of Black women's lives. And I think what's interesting to me about the series, and as someone who has, you know, done some work on Walker, is how there were so many more interesting stories in her life that could have been amplified. Like she, her life is literally, it reads like a script. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this kind of, you know, the, the Horatio Algerian nature of her, her meteoric rise from rags to riches, um, the way that she engaged in pretty much every kind of major movement of the early 20th century. You know, um, Dr. Freeman, you know, talked about this a little, like, you know, she was in circles with Ida B. Wells and Marcus Garvey. I mean, they do show Booker T. Washington and sort of amplified Du Bois in her life, but there were, I mean, tons of folks, you know, people who were considered unsavory characters, like, you know, William Monroe Trotter, who was seen as a radical, who, you know, F.B. Ransom wanted to protect her from, right? She was engaged in the Black Women's Club movement of that era, right? So to me, I think what I was most excited about when I first heard about this production wasn't just that Madam's story was going to be told as important as that is and how much myth there is about her, but it really, she becomes this Black woman's lens into this early 20th century moment, a moment that we really don't get to see in any kind of film or television. We might get Harlem, right, from the Harlem Renaissance, and certainly Madame was there too, right? You know, she, she, you know, it's, she almost has a, a Forrest Gumpian way where you could have used her as this incredible storyteller of that early 20th century and all the major movements from anti-lynching to the business movements and all of that, and to have that 
seen through the eyes of a black woman to me, and again, I am a historian and I, I'm, you know, I, I am, you know, veracity of, of factual information is important, but it just unfolds as a story. And when I just tell people, you know, this weekend I said I had like a Madam C.J. Walker therapy hotline because I think everybody I knew called me at some point. And when I would tell them actual things from her life, they were more blown away by that than some of what they saw in the film. And so I think that's really it. It would have been a journey through the early 20th century, late 19th, early 20th century through a black woman's eyes um, that really could have been made for beautiful storytelling, visual storytelling. But I do want to say on the plus side, I thought that some of the wigs that they had for hair were gorgeous. Yeah, they were. I was busy like taking notes on some of them, you know, <laughs> on like how, what, what can be done with natural hair. Mm -hmm. um, I also thought that the lighting was gorgeous at points. It, it's not always the case that you watch films with Black people in it, especially Black people with different skin tone, um, and you can actually differentiate and see that someone took some care um, and some, some time and concern with what kind of clothes you were putting them in. I wouldn't have put them in those clothes necessarily, but the clothes look great. <laughs> like They were well constructed, and like I said, the hair looked great. And I appreciated the, the, the lighting and some of the cinematography. Mm -hmm. um, those for, for uh, the art, the art came through at certain, at certain points. It just got kind of fouled up with some of their um, uh, trying to make money or ideology or just wrongheaded understanding um, of what was happening at that period. Yeah, I, I think that's actually, um leads me to the next question, which, you know, I, I didn't have the, the hotline like uh, Dr. Gill, uh, but definitely my friends and family members were, who were watching Self Made um, had questions about this sort of strong theme around colorism uh, that was really quite central in each of the four episodes um, of Self Made. And so maybe we could take a moment to unpack the, the utility of this focus. Why, why do we think um, this focus uh, on, on uh, colorism was so um, strong and central throughout? And what was the utility of it, if any? I personally would like my panelists to help me understand that scene with the uh, with the grandmother, with Addie's grandmother, who's all like, but you light skin and got good hair. You can do it. Like, I, I, I just, I could not even understand in a, in a um, series that was clearly attempting to make that um, one of the, the, the characters, the main themes, the thing. That the lens that you need to understand this period in Madam is uh, these color politics. Even then, I'm on some of y'all. Please help me understand what what they were going for, what that was uh, attempting to do for the rest of the film. I don't know. Panelists, Panelists? any suggestions, thoughts? <laughs> Boy, that you know that one. That one. That scene needed some prayer. Um, I think you know. Colorism is real, and we, it's a very, it's a very important part of our society. It's often not talked about as much as we need to. For me, that went to a moment of, you know, the ninth grade writing assignment, show with your writing versus telling with your writing. And the scenes seem to be thrown in there just to make it ex as explicit as possible for the audience that that's what was going on with this character. And trying to show some emotional pain from our character, Annie, who was struggling because she never got accepted as her own personal self. So it was trying to do a whole lot, but it was so sloppy. It was so, so it, it also was showed us that Addie, among other things, failed at being light skinned, right? Like I was like, she can't even do light skin straight hair right. Like not <laughs> failing at her business. She can't pay her butler. She can't <laughs> hold on to her whatever. And she don't know how to be be light skinned. <laughs> I mean, the worst part, I mean, the, it was so odd to me because so this is yeah. a character that is, I don't even want to say loosely based on Annie Malone because, like I said, there, there was, and Annie Malone needs a biography. I mean, she's just one of those people, um, in terms of her legacy and name, she just needs a biography. But um, 
it was unrecognizable because this was not a woman who was part of this kind of light skin elite. Both of her parents were black. I mean, she she just like this this kind of backdrop of this story was just so not her life. And I, I wondered what the utility of that was. I mean, to me, um, it sort of obscured a lot of what both Annie and um, Madam Walker were were really attacking, right? Which a lot of the, and you know, they had their flaws and their issues and all of that and how they did it, we can critique that. But at the heart, they understood that the enemy for black women at that time was a racist economic system that kept them from pursuing, you know, um, a livelihood, right? Um, that these structures that were in place that kept women out um, of uh, black women out from anything except you know domestic labor and giving these women opportunities. They created colleges, right? That these these beauty colleges would have graduations where the women would wear white like they were at Spelman, right? Like giving women who were typically in the working class or married women who, for example, if they wanted to be teachers, you couldn't be a teacher and be married at the time, giving them sources of income. And so while they certainly had a business rivalry, and I think that would have been fun to play with on, on um, visually um, to think about that, um, really, they saw as their greatest enemy um, just an economic system that kept Black women oppressed. And so you lose that when mm -hmm. the kind of main, you know, tension, and, I, you know, what I understand from film and filmmaking, like, you know, you need that tension there, right? That's what keeps us watching. That tension was collapsed internally within Black women, even though colorism and class is issues were an issue. And Madam Walker had to navigate those, right? She was always in circles that were bigger than her. And I think a lot of her philanthropy was, you know, drawn by that, you know, what, um, what Tyrone's work really shows us. So, so yeah, but that, that wasn't sort of the driving conflict of Madam's life, certainly. And it was surprising to see that. What do, we, what do we think about those fight scenes? That's one thing that I kept seeing on social media. Um, how did that work in terms of the series? And um, Andre, I'm looking at I'm looking to you, of course. Uh, but and well, actually, any of us can answer it because um, you know I found them to be um, uh, jarring uh, and somewhat out of place. But I didn't know if there was perhaps some uh, structural reason for these fight scenes to to be there. Well, I think, and it also speaks to a point that Noliwe and Tiffany both raised, um, that the Addie character, to me, read it very much as Jane Toussaint from school days, mm -hmm. you know, even down to the strawberry blonde hair. So the fight scenes, to me, kind of mimicked the beauty shop rivalry dance-off dance battle scene in school days. You know, so it was a, a way that for some of us older folks for us to be able to see that film and that moment in the film as a particular touch point. And then for younger people, you know, to see it as a way to imagine a rivalry between two women and it has to come down to fisticuffs. I mean, I didn't think that it worked as a narrative device, as a strategy at all. And it also set up for me another problem with the colorism piece, which is how they use colorism to stand in for so many other categories, like age, for example. Age falls out of this series altogether because the time frame is so compressed. So in the moment where CJ is having an affair with the other saleswoman, you know, and, and Madam is like, you could have messed around with anybody, but it had to be her, you know, it's, we're supposed to believe it's because she's high yellow, right? Not like, you had no feelings about her being a younger woman, right? There's no conversation around age and black women and age. Uh, colorism becomes a stand-in for class. It becomes a stand-in for being born on a plantation versus being born free. It becomes a, a, a stand-in for the, the South or the country versus the more industrialized spaces. And I just thought that a lot of that, all those things were missed opportunities to have conversations or do some amazing storytelling around something else other than colorism and something else other than a literal duke out between two black women, you know? Like even, even my mother, she and I talked about this and she was like, oh, so that boxing, like, what was that about? You know, and I was like, yeah, I, what was that about mom? You know, so I'm glad, I love to hear other people's thoughts about, about that boxing scene as a narrative device. And of course we know Jack Johnson and you know, all the excitement and energy around boxing at that time, but 
but why bring that moment in? Mm. You know, as I as I watch as I watch that scene and all the additional fantasy scenes, I mean, I didn't see the scripts prior to them being filmed and made. And I wonder, just thinking about the process of making a film, and I mentioned this earlier about getting stuck and needing something else. The fantasy scenes that come a little bit later almost work, you know, when they're when she has a fantasy of the young woman on the bicycle who's the figure that are that Mr. CJ wants to put out that she doesn't prove. And the flashbacks to her life on a being raised on a plantation in the house where her family was enslaved. Um, those moments, I think they were trying to please, ease up to them. My mind went to with the boxing scene. I could see folk, I could see someone in the edit room pretty far down the line and say, you know what, we need to go shoot something else, but this isn't working. Mm -hmm. And then to go back, that happens often in film. Mm -hmm. You go back and you try and you reshoot, refilm something else that's a fit. And sometimes it's just like, you are really trying to make a circle of a square. Like that's what that felt like for that moment for me, because they, they didn't work. Like I, I also thought about Spike Lee's attention to his uh, over-dramatized, extravagant scenes. Like Spike Lee really did it with his movies that came out with that. And I thought maybe there's a nod to that, because you remember these filmmakers are all basically students of, of Spike and mm -hmm. are, have learned a lesson from him, maybe trying to emulate him. But it, I also, my, my, I say this, I really felt the hand of the white gaze on this film in many ways. Mm. When it comes to executives who hold the purse strings, who get to make decisions that you may not want to live with and work with, it sometimes it really comes down to that. If a filmmaker can have a, an idea, a concept, and then you get into the meeting of the office, you go, oh, that's really nice. But you know what? How about the women fighting? I mean, I could see, I've been in those meetings where you're pitching something and a pushback and you sit there like, do I make this? Or do I not make this? Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For me, it also, um, those scenes kind of overplayed the, the individual striving at the expense of the collective striving. And I mean, there's not this, I mean, she talks, she has her speech about uh, uplift and respectability, but I mean, she's kind of relentlessly pursuing a million dollars in the film, right? There's this sense that what is that million dollars for? Or what is this directed towards? Um, and how is she, you know, uh, Freeman B. Ransom called the company a race company in line with the ways that the clubs and the schools and the other institutions in the community were operating, that this was for the people, by the people, and was part of that collective uplift. And so but you, you miss that. It's just kind of, I just want to be this millionaire, but there's no sense of purpose behind that. And that, that was deeply troubling to me because she wasn't on some kind of Carnegie pursuit. Um, she, was, she was seriously in the trenches, as has been said, um, and that this was all directed towards, you know, how do we overcome this system? How do we create these opportunities for ourselves? I mean, in many ways, she, she, she doesn't succeed because of America. She succeeds in spite of America, right? Mm -hmm. She's turning the system on its head to try to thwart Jim Crow and use these segregated economies against the system itself. And so, but you, you don't get that, that sense uh, in, in the series. Dr. Freeman, could you, I wonder if you could follow up a little bit and to, to fill in the gaps, because we don't, I agree with you that we don't really see or learn much about her philanthropy. Um, and I think that would have been just a wonderful opportunity, a portal into um, 20th century uh, Black America in many ways. So maybe you could yeah. talk a little bit about the ways that uh, her philanthropy impacted on the, the lives of, of Black people. Yeah, um, one, one of the things that I, I found in my research that in 1952, uh, Walter White, the executive secretary of the NAACP, was at a graveside memorial at Madam Walker's uh, at the cemetery in, in the Bronx. And um, uh, agents and beauticians had gathered to honor her and induct her and, and Annie Malone and Sarah Spencer Washington into a, an honor society. Uh, but one of the things that he said was that, um, that Madam Walker's generosity enabled the NAACP to survive the depression. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about that and the power of that, um, that, that NAACP was just coming along when her business was accelerating and she gave to it uh, and, and was behind many of its movements. And for him to say this decades later, I mean, it makes us think about that historians talk about the long civil rights movement, right? That, 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 that she's helping to fund and, and donors of that era are funding organizations and propelling them forward to future generations to benefit from, right? So that it 
becomes part of the backbone of the civil rights era. You don't get the sense of how um, uh, that, that, that she used her money, which was just one of those gifts, uh, to support many of these types of these organizations, from Tuskegee to Charlotte Hawkins Brown School to Mary McLeod Beth Bethune School, NACW. Um, but there's also this, this idea where she is fundamentally different than the, 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 the prevailing models of philanthropy at the time. That's why this, this Carnegie and Rockefellerian portrayal is, is problematic because she was very clear that she was not like them, right? Their, their model is to spend your life accumulating wealth and then late in life arrive at a sense of responsibility for others and engage philanthropically. Uh, Sarah Breedlove was giving when she was a homeless, penniless migrant at St. Paul's as a part of the Might Missionary Society and becomes a part of that same network that helped save her and Lilia when she first arrived there in, in the early 18 or the late 18. Uh, uh, 90s. So um, it, it, you, you miss that sense that her philanthropy is something that grows and evolves as her resources grow and evolve, but the responsibility to give, the responsibility to engage, the responsibility to speak out is, is, is what Black women across many different aspects of the community were doing, and she was following suit because she was socialized by club women, by church women, um, into this ethos of giving. And so that, that, that was definitely a missed opportunity. And again, it wasn't an auxiliary thing. It wasn't and just oh and like the footnotes say at the end that she gave this was something that was regular I mean you see in her correspondence with Freeman B Ransom when she's traveling she'll say send these products to this city she'll say hire this person fire this person she'll also say oh by the way I also gave this gift or I went to this meeting make sure we participate in, in XYZ so um, her generosity and her engagement and activism almost knew no bounds and that is reflective of the broader approach to philanthropy among African Americans, which was pioneered by black women. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I can't, I'm, I'm keeping a watch on our time and we're, we're actually quickly approaching our, um, our end point, but I, I have a, just a, a little bit more, a few, a few more questions that I want to make sure that we get to quickly because, um, you know, first I, I want to offer, um, really a note of gratitude to Alilia Bundles for the life work that she's done um, with Madam and her family, basically resurrecting this story and bringing it forward. And so um, we're grateful to her and that her, her book was optioned for um, self-made. Wondering if we could talk um, about the triumphs of self-made. Anyone? I think for me, one of the visuals that I found striking was the scene when they're at the, the villa. Mm. And you see all of these Black people on this estate, you know, and that to me is one moment where we start to see visually represented the kind of breadth of Madam's Reach, right? Like the kind of way that she is pulling in Black people from various parts of the community, you know, to that, that place. I thought that that for me was, it was really empowering to see that. Um, I think that while there were uh, some choices made that, that you know, we can, we can think through why they were made in particular ways. I thought it was empowering to see the differentiation between Black women of Madam's generation and of Lilia's generation. That, you know, she's being able to imagine a certain kind of freedom um, of person, freedom of space, freedom to travel and see the world, which was something that was very central to uh, Lilia Walker's life, you know, travel. She was big into travel. She saw so much of the world and journaled it very beautifully in her own personal diaries. And so to me, those were, were moments that I thought like, wow, this visually they're doing a certain kind of storytelling that I think is empowering to young Black people, especially that travel piece in this moment where Black travel is all over social media and Instagram and kind of creating this Instagrammable Black, carefree Black girl life. I think the, the series was really trying to say something about that through the Lilia Walker character. 
one of the things that stood out to me is when, uh, whenever Sarah or Madam was uh, kind of getting down herself or starts deviating, when she comes back and focuses on her own story, she moves forward. And I thought that was pretty powerful. I mean, you see that with when CJ wants to create a certain kind of Walker girl. She, you know, she, she kind of goes with it a little bit, then she pushes back and says, no, right? I'm going to put myself on there. Uh, you know, when Addie, when Addie upstages her at church and she runs out to the bathroom and is frustrated and is scared and that, that beautiful work where she's looking in the mirror of her former self. Um, and there's this kind of this moment where she could kind of go back into self-doubt and self-fear, or she can push forward with this vision and this idea. Um, and that's what she does. She goes back and she re, re, you know, invigorates uh, her, her approach uh, to that. So I think there's something powerful there about that, but it's her own story that brings her back on track um, and helps her move forward that I think was, was done pretty, pretty well in the series. And I think it's, it's created a hunger. I mean, what was really interesting in all the conversations that I saw either online or the people calling me was that people wanted to know more. Um, and so I think this is really great opportunity where um, archival information about these women is accessible in ways that just didn't exist before. So the Madam Walker papers, I believe from the Indiana Historical Society have just recently been digitized. Yes. It would have made my you know, life easier as a researcher at the time, but like folks can actually go now online and look through the letters and all of that um, and look through her correspondence, look through her speeches. And so I think there was a way that it was done that got people asking more questions. And, and you know, as, as teachers and researchers and scholars, I always say to my students, you know, at the end of the semester, if I've, you know, if, if you have more questions that you want to go forward with, then I've really done my job. And so I, I do think this will um, help people ask more questions um, about Black women's lives. Um, and, and we can even, you know, begin to point people that you can actually go and see some of the raw data of this, as well as reading the, the histories that have already been produced. I, you know, I, when I think about... Go ahead, Andre. I'll be quick. I think of two moments of triumph um, with the with the piece. Uh, one is the blackity blackity blackness of it. You mm -hmm. know the fact that it is out there and created. It is giving such beautiful contextual, not contextual, beautiful moments and beautiful lightings and scenes and the people. It was beautiful. That that moment in Harlem, I've always thought I've always wanted to go and walk through the streets of Harlem during the Harlem Renaissance, and that gave me a, a little peek into it. And then the second is. Um, the actually, the fact that it's actually made, it's not perfect. Um, it's a little bit of us fighting over crumbs, as Ms. Balhooks has said to us before, where we're grabbing at these little pieces. And that's not enough, but for me, there is a bit of a triumph in the sense that this is on screen to connect with what Dr. Yo just talked about in terms of people being interested and curious. I really did have a few young women, while it's not true, and I hope you all can correct it, being like, I didn't know she invented the hot cone. You know, I didn't have the exact answer for that. But that moment right there of them feeling empowered and thinking like, these products came from a black woman. That, while it's not completely accurate, the story itself, that moment of triumph for me was, um, is important. I'll just say really, really briefly, what I, what I was thinking watching it is, this is a historical, like taken as a whole, you see a real historical antecedent to the, um, to the saying you see very often online, or at least on my social media, all we have is us. Mm. Um, you really get a, a sense uh, at points that for, for Walker, I mean, Walker needed other black women. Um, other black women needed Walker to, to that, that scene that um, Tanisha mentioned at the end where, you know, people are saying, yes, in 1971, I was the national representative of this, or, you know, in 1945, I did, uh, they needed her as much as she needed them. And what those two, um, what they did together is really legendary and, and, and um, I think is a roadmap for us about how to progress ultimately. Well, I think we are um, approaching the end of our time together. And um, what I'd like to say, uh, sort of, I think on behalf of all of us, is that um, we're, we're grateful for um, series and films that um, center the lives of Black people and that it clearly 
um, they're still, we're still starved, right, for more, um, uh, more content. Um, and in this moment when there appears to be this kind of mad dash by companies like Netflix for content, 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 um, that we really hope that um, more of these uh, production companies um, spend a little time with the historians. Uh, because I do think that we um, have something to offer that we we want very much for these stories to to be the the storytellers. That's what we do as as scholars, as filmmakers. Uh, we tell stories, and um, I think that our uh, our background, our knowledge, helps with authenticity. Um, and so I'm hoping that in the future we see more of a connection more work between um, traditional kind of scholars, historian types, writers, um, with those in, in film and television. I think it's a, a collaboration that only makes sense because I think ultimately we all want the same thing, which is to get it right for, for different reasons, but we want to get it right. Uh, so I wanna thank this panel of uh, fantastic folks. Thank you for uh, coming together relatively quickly and in different circumstances. Uh, thank you for, for weighing in. And I also want to thank uh, our viewers with uh, ABWH Television. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to, to speak to the things that mean the most to you. Uh, and we'll ask you to, um, to stay tuned uh, for our coming episode, our forthcoming episode of ABWH Television. But once again, thank you for joining us um, and be well.